Hello, I'm Guy, and this is Guy Robot. Hello, and welcome to the latest of my blockchain bonanza. Today, I'm going to be talking about proof of work. Before I get on to that, just a quick reminder of why I'm doing this series. I've spent the last month working away at a new startup trying to get it running on the Ethereum network. It's an investment trading fund that will trade cryptocurrencies. If you're interested, please do check it over at smartift.com for some more information. Link is below. But today, I'm going to be talking about proof of work and what that is. We covered mining last time and kind of vaguely alluded there was something you did to mine. Thinking of it in traditional terms, mining being you go digging and you find a lump of gold and hurrah, you're rich. Apart from there isn't a spade or like a pan thing. Is it a pan? I don't know. I don't do gold mining. Either way, you don't have those in the crypto world. So how is it you do that mining? Well, the answer is it's called proof of work. As we discussed last time, miners are there to show that they are or rather they are there to secure the network and proof of work shows that they are securing the network. One of the most common algorithms that's used for proof of work is SHA-256 because that's what Bitcoin came up with and almost every coin just lifted Bitcoin straight away and copied it. So what actually happens? Well, first we need to know what a hash is. So in cryptographic terms, you've got a couple of things you can do. You can either encrypt data which is where you take the data, you have a password, and then you get a bunch of gibberish out, and you can take that gibberish and get the original data back with the password. However, a hash is a one-way operation. So you take some data, you hash it, you get gibberish out, and that gibberish um, is, you can't get back to the original. You would have to take every single piece of possible data in the entire universe and hash it and see which hash matched. The idea being it is a unique thumbprint to that data. Theoretically, on a good algorithm, you would never have the same thumbprint for two pieces of data. So whether you want to hash the number seven or a two gigabyte movie, they will each have completely unique hashes. And the hashes are really tiny. They're like 32 letters long or 64, depending on whatever the algorithm is that you've got. So this hash is a one-way operation. SHA-256 is one of the most common hashing algorithms. I won't bother describing how it works, go into the detail, it doesn't matter. The whole point is it takes the original data, it does a bunch of maths to it, and then you get this chunk of letters out of it. Or rather, you get a binary data string out of it. And then how it works in Bitcoin is there's a difficulty set which describes how hard it should be to mine at the moment. And that difficulty adjusts based on how many people are mining on the network. The idea being in Bitcoin's case that they want one block or one nugget of gold as it were to be found every 10 minutes. So the more people that mine with the more power, the more difficult it gets set so that it's harder for people to find uh, those blocks with the same amount of hashing power. If suddenly everybody just stopped mining on Bitcoin, then you'd be able to go back and use a laptop from 50, 50 years ago, but 20 years ago and find Bitcoin because it would suddenly be incredibly easy to mine with. And so how Bitcoin works is that difficulty describes how many zeros you want to have at the start of a hash. So you hash a number, and you see how many zeros it's got. If it's not got enough, you hash another one and you see how many zeros it's got. So a difficulty of one means you've only got to have one zero at the start of it. A difficulty of like all of the zeros is incredibly difficult because you have to keep hashing random numbers with a bunch of other data until you get this certain thing. So basically it's a totally pointless operation. All it does is show that you're working hard. And if you've got a really high difficulty level set, you have to hash billions and billions of things before you'll find the correct answer. So you in effect take a bunch of data related to the current block you're on and you start and you add the number one and then you hash it and you see how many zeros there are and then you do it with the number two and you see how many zeros there are and you do this millions of times every single second. And that is what the Bitcoin algorithm does. And eventually somebody goes, ah, I found it. All I had to do was take this random string and this bit of data and then put this magic number with it and it came to this random gibberish. Congratulations, you've just earned 50 Bitcoins. That's proof of work. Basically, all it does is it shows that you are a miner and you're invested in it. It doesn't matter what that data is. That data, meaningless, gets thrown away. The whole point is just to prove that you have a whole bunch of machinery that's committed to securing the Bitcoin network. And every now and then, 
you will successfully find whatever the random number is and you win a prize for it. And that's it pretty much. You then announce to the rest of the Bitcoin network saying, or the, whatever coin is, in this example, Bitcoin, you say, I found it, here's a magic number. Everyone else goes, yeah, you did find it. And then you get the coins and you get the transaction fees and you've successfully created that block on the blockchain. And then it all starts again and it carries on. That's proof of work. It's just some pointless, meaningless mathematical operation that shows that you're doing stuff. There are a whole bunch of other algorithms depending on the coin you've got. Script is one of the other really popular ones. Some of them have got ASICs, which is dedicated hardware for them. Some of them work on graphics cards. Uh, there's a couple that only work on CPUs. So there's one that generates uh, prime number six tuplets, and that one still doesn't work on graphics card. It can only work on CPUs. So it totally depends on what the algorithm is as to how difficult it is and what hardware you need for it and consequently the investment cost that you're going to have to do proof of work mining. The last thing that's worth mentioning is the energy costs involved in proof of work. It's not really difficult to see that everything I've just mentioned is totally and utterly pointless. It's it's just doing maths for the sake of maths. It's like giving somebody a bunch of times tables and asking them to do random ones endlessly and if they happen to get to page 732, congratulations, they get a suite. It's pointless and Pointless mathematical operations use a lot of energy. They are the things that our computers and graphics cards are designed to do. So the more you throw at them, they run at their maximum temperature and they draw a lot of power. You are talking entire cities worth of power thrown at Bitcoin networks. It's often one of the hardest things to do to make money out of it is get your energy price low enough that you can invest in the hardware and mine for the energy cost, which often puts a lot of Western countries out of kilt with somewhere like China, where there's a lot of energy at very low costs if you're a miner. So all of this, however good it is, comes at the cost of a massive energy cost that's completely and utterly wasted. Proof of work does nothing for anyone bar the network itself. So keeping Bitcoin running is using entire cities of power. And that's worth considering when you're considering what kind of cryptocurrency you'd like to be involved in or you'd like to mine. If you don't mind just using energy for the sake of it or all of your energy is completely renewable, then that's one thing. If, however, you care about the environment, you might want to consider some other options for it. And we're going to cover those in the next couple of videos. We're looking at proof of stake and we're looking at proof of capacity. There's also proof of research, which I'm not going to do a video on, I don't think. We might get around to it which is an idea where rather than doing something totally meaningless, you still use a lot of computing power, but you're trying to solve a real scientific problem. There's a couple of coins that do that. They're a lot less popular. But over the next couple of videos, we'll look at some better energy utilization ones. Hope you found today's video useful. If you did, thumbs up. Let me know below in the comments. Also, check me out as Guy Robot TV on Twitter and my blog at GuyRobot.tv. And don't forget to go and take a look at the Smart Investment Fund token at SmartIFT.com link in the description below, which is the blockchain startup I'm currently involved in. Thanks, and don't forget to subscribe.